Hello ladies and gents and welcome to today's episode where I'm bringing you a sales Jedi to explore together with me about creating revenue opportunities with a white glove approach in marketing and sales. Hi Paul and thanks for accepting my invitation. Absolutely, thanks for inviting me. And there's something special about today's guest, ladies and gents. The guest has it in his DNA, you know, this tradition of sales and marketing. Paul, could you give us a bit of background over here about the generations that migrated from Europe and started into sales and advertising? Sure. So we were talking a little bit about this off camera, but my last name, Fader, um, has sort of roots in uh, feather pen coming from Hungary. Uh, we were printers, um, mm -hmm. and we continued this tradition coming over here to America in Detroit, Michigan. The Union Trade newspapers were printed by, or a lot of them, were printed by my great-grandfather, and he took those printing genes and passed them down to his son, and he sold advertising and made great big print and newspapers and cards and all that sort of stuff. And even my mom got in on the game and, and she did some sales in, in Yellow Pages, which is where I first started both sales and advertising. And uh, yeah, it's been sort of a family business ever since. Oh, and I, and I think, you know, we tend to underestimate the importance of this uh, legacy if we look back to it. But when, when you grow with it, you tend to feel more natural when you go into sales and, and marketing. So, well, I mean, they keep they keep <clears throat> saying that, you know, your genes dictate so much about you and that we can have sort of these experiences in our mm -hmm. lives that carry through our genes, maybe, you know, work and trade <laughs> some of those same patterns. Well, definitely, you know, trading is a big thing. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say they, they are sales gurus or sales people or sales season folks, but it's... It's very easy to, when you're a connoisseur, you have a bit of experience, it's easy to make a, a difference. We'll, uh, we'll deep dive into that. But for now, let's see, uh, what's your current role right now, Paul? And uh, what have you done in the past? And how you got to become today's Paul? <clears throat> sure. So I'm a VP of Business Development at Healthware. We are an international BPO um, with specialization in healthcare and a few other industries. Um, from my perspective, being from Detroit, Michigan, obviously I've specialized in automotive throughout my entire career. Um, but, you know, it's all about opening new business opportunities. There's a little bit of farming, for, but for the most part, it's going out there and opening up new logos and trying to get new business um, for our company. That's, uh, that's very modest of you. So <laughs> that was really in a nutshell. But I, I would like us to talk a bit about uh, your background in multinationals because uh, you know hunting logos is quite a difficult game um, and uh, a lot a lot of transformation happens through this process and a lot of companies out there offer kind of the same thing right so as a salesperson you're heading towards other salesperson that are offering the same thing and you can make a difference through your personality, through your connection, through your promises, through your style of delivery, you can actually make a difference. And, and companies should appreciate this more. So how do you actually make a difference as an individual, you know, in, in, in an industry that sells a lot of the same thing? Yeah, I mean, BPO has certainly become a bit of a commodity, right? We've rebranded so many different times in so many different ways. You know, people as a service, software as a service, I remember being thrown around a couple of years ago. Um, you know, there's a little bit of diversification in terms of the services that you provide, whether it's IT or, you know, heavy technical support or back office, some of the data labeling and annotation for like autonomous driving. Um, but when you get down to sort of the L1, L0 customer service, a lot of that stuff is absolutely the same thing, right? And so yeah. when you look at specialization, you're looking at, okay, what types of emerging markets where we can create rate or cost advantages, what type of language, you know, issues might we have, mm -hmm. you know, a big one here in North America, a great example of that is Canada, right? The Canadian yeah. market is a very difficult one to penetrate because when you think of French, it's not French, it's French Canadian, it's completely different type of language and staffing that anywhere in the world without, uh, you know, some strong coaching will lead to extremely strong feedback. And so, you know, 
when we look at how do you differentiate, I think the biggest thing from my role as the sales executive is to make sure that you're going in there. And number one, you have to do that sort of needs analysis, right? When you go in and you start having these conversations, you figure you're one of three or you're one of five. You're coming in either on an RFP discussion or potentially you're creating your own opportunities because, you know, the timing might not be perfect when you're talking to that prospect, yeah. right? So that first initial discussion is so important to find out, you know, what problems are they having? Is it a quality concern? <laughs> is it staff optimization, workforce management? You know, are they getting abused by their curtain provider because, you know, there's just so much breakage in terms of the productive hour or something like that? Um, is it they have a, a really difficult language? I mean, outside of French Canadian, I think a lot of us talk about uh, Japanese as being one of those ones where it's always sort of a onesie twosie in an international. And it's very, you can't get that if you've got operations, let's say in Ukraine or South Africa or Mexico or, you know, wherever you're staffing people, Philippines, it's like, where do you get that one Japanese speaker, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know why I'm so, laughing? Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you because we went through ahead. a we, we had a common episode with Swiss German, if you recall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I was just, you know, uh, envisioning this exercise that you're provoking the client, which doesn't necessarily have a need right now, to spit out the actual need. What did they actually need? Okay, because you, you, you can speak out loud and say, I need five folks with German. Right. That is such a vanilla or a general uh, need. And, you know, you have to slice and dice this very much, as you said. So you have to keep on drilling to make sure that at the end of the day, they're actually serving for the purpose or they're actually solving the problem for which you have committed. Otherwise, you, you will fail 100% as a vendor. You will ruin a relationship. And guess whose fault is it at the end of the day? It's going to be your fault, Paul, and your team's fault. It's not going to be the client who didn't think that there's any difference between French uh, Canadian and French, uh, the real French, or pigeon French, or you know German and Swiss German. But the nuances are are so different that you know for the folks they get irritated very easily over the phone over there. So that was my short bracket. Sorry to interrupt. Well, I, I mean it's a perfect example, right? That's an optimal situation where you can create differentiation without anything having to do with your company, right? Mm -hmm. As the sales executive, knowing to probe, knowing to ask those types of questions, leading that prospect sort of down the train. You know, if you're a buck higher, a quarter yeah. higher, three bucks higher, but you understand those types of sort of specializations and what their customers are ultimately looking for, that might provoke, you know, a quality discussion that they had in a meeting and all of a sudden, no, that is a key differentiator. And this is the only guy, the only gal who's talking to me about these types of things, who understands these types of things. I think particularly when we're talking about international business, that is 100% one of those keys. And I think the other part of it, too, is understanding who your prospect is, right? Mm -hmm. I, I had a recent deal. I was in Germany um, for, for this prospect. And our I basically had to be the negotiator between our operations people and that customer's need because they wanted to staff and they wanted to source in Berlin, in Germany, right? Mm -hmm. And our ops folks are like, that, that's crazy. You know, there's a lot of labor issues that would come into play. This is a very expensive place to be. You know, what what is could possibly be the reason behind that? And in reality, the customer wanted something that was a little bit closer to home. Their operations were in Berlin, in yeah. Germany. They wanted to make sure that for them, pre-COVID or post-COVID, they don't have a, a physical office there. They're 100% remote. So this would be their first office that they could actually come into. And they wanted wow. to hotel at our <laughs> facilities for, you know, but, but understanding those types of things, asking those types of questions are sort of those key things that we need to be doing as sales professionals and also how we defend our solution or we defend our choices to our internal teams to make sure that we're putting that best foot forward. Yeah, I've, I've been through a similar experience and I was surprised what could cascade from that prospect starting very small and cautious uh, with us, you know, um, using facilities that we had and, and using, you know, the, the, the local know-how that we had. And uh, we went pretty big. And uh, eventually, I think, you know, executives uh, have to take that risk 
uh, which is coming from a very thorough analysis, as you said, you know, cost benefit analysis of actually growing locally or, or, you know, taking a leap of faith over there or a jump with a, with a client that, you know, at the beginning of the analysis, things don't look exemplary. But where is yeah. this? Yeah. Where is this leading and, you know, how it can be cultivated? And I came to discover, and I want to get your point of view over here, that most of the times, there were internal in assumptions about what clients would do or not do that were standing in the way of business. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, we've had this conversation together before <laughs> where, you know, I talk a little bit about, you know, some of the differentiators that you can make in sales being the solution itself, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it can be very difficult for junior sales executives or even ops uh, in particular where, you think of the solution in terms of like for BPO, our ratios, right? These are what they are. There's yeah. no deviation between this. And it's like, you know what? If a customer asks for an additional QA resource or is adamant about a dedicated trainer or needs to have certain things met about the site or the solution, we as sales executives need to be the ones that are flexible. Our whole point of, of reference from an internal perspective is to test our ops people, right? And say, hey, what do you think about this? What about this? And most times I've found that when you get right down to it, the only rationale is because we've always done it this way. And all of a sudden you can take a pricing scenario or a solution scenario and completely turn it on its head and make it so perfect and tailored for the client. And, oh, by the way, now this could be a potential new best practice for us because we're seeing that operations are significantly better, maybe for this industry or this particular vertical, um, when we do things this way. And, and so, again, that's, you know, the hallmark of a, a good sales professional. And I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being hyped up as, as the best or a Jedi or things like that. But, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we're just trying to kind of make our way, right? But I think the hallmark of a good sales professional is somebody who's testing both sides, right? You're an advocate for your client and you're an advocate <coughs> for the company and making that sort of match is, is the responsibility of the role and what makes a, a, a good versus a bad, I guess, or a not great. Yeah, I remember those days in which I used to have, uh, let's say, senior sales folks around me and and. They would walk into a meeting with me and feel completely drained afterwards because I would challenge the status quo in every crumble that existed over there and say, did you ask the, the, the client this? Would the client be open to do this? Would the client consider this? Would the client have this need? And, um, you know, uh, with some of them got really irritated about this drilling process, but some of them, as we had the, uh, the occasion to work together, were, were constantly thinking, oh, have I asked this? Have I not asked this? Oh, I know the client better. Maybe I can ask this. Oh, I cannot ask this because this is, you know, over the edge. Um, so it's not only a challenge. So, so it's like a, a, a two-way challenge internally that should happen from delivery or operational to sales and sales to operational before we go back to uh, the client. And I think what can really make a difference is going back with some key questions or observations showing that client without knowing their vision or their future plans that you're thinking ahead of the game. You're not thinking just to put the band-aid right now and, and secure the deal. You're looking at the, uh, let's say, average uh, lifetime contract value over there or potential lifetime contract that can exist. And I think there are very few that do this. Uh, th there is a school that teaches this, like in, in practice, like you would have a senior salesperson that would teach you this, but this has to come from inside. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking about this side of the coin of sales specifically, yeah. but if you want me to wax poetic about uh, operations, I mean, you're 100% right. You know, when you have an operations person that's also helping you to sort of sharpen that steel, right, who's bouncing things off of you, who's bringing options and operational challenges to the table, that's so much better. I mean, it can be frustrating in the short term for sure, um, but making sure that you're defending your points, that you're having those types of conversations, it opens up all types of new options, right? Because a lot of times, and this can be difficult for sales professionals, right? You mm -hmm. have the RFP in front of you, right? Yeah. And you're just reading what they want, what they're telling you. 
Yeah. And maybe you haven't had the opportunity to make that relationship yet, right? You haven't had the opportunity or you don't get the opportunity to, to talk to the prospect until you've gotten past step one. So we're all guessing, right? We're all making assumptions. And if it's always going to be, hey, this is what I want, or we're going to follow you know, to the letter what's on the RFP, I think you're going to have a really challenging time differentiating yourself and ultimately winning business because you're just giving them what they've asked for. And those folks that kind of stand out and provide experience, that almost in every case is what prospects tells you as feedback that they've wanted, right? We want somebody with experience who can give us a perspective that we don't have now and who can make our operations better, right? I mean, yeah, there's absolutely situations where, hey, we just want to save a buck, right? Yeah. But in most cases, I would say, I don't know, 95%, they're not going to buy the cheapest option, right? There's always going to be a lower cost provider out there, particularly in BPO. Right? You don't want to be in you that know? race, trust me. No, you do not. I mean, because you can't keep a customer like that, right? If, if they are in that 5% that are just buying based on price, I mean, listen, as a salesperson, we'll always write a deal. We're never going to turn down revenue, right? We have goals, we have, you know, commissions to make. but Ultimately, that type of client is exhausting both to your operations team and to you because they're always going to be beating you up. They're always going to be challenging that. And it really doesn't, it, it doesn't matter about the end client, right? Their customers, the first people you're trying to service. It, it's just a very bad relationship in that. And, and the way. sad thing about that kind of company, if you work in sales, then, you know, the company can run without the sales department if it's just a lower buck. So, <laughs> yeah, you're not a chatbot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can put a chatbot. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to share if that's okay with you uh, an experience I had with an RFP when uh, I just felt that the need was too vanilla. But I, I had a direct connect with an executive at that company. And mm -hmm. I decided to call him. And, and, and in fact, it was like, I don't want to book a call. I just want to have like, you know, a random call when you feel chill and you're not in front of the computer. Yeah. And uh, we had that conversation. Initially, we said 15 minutes. It ended up an hour and a half. And, you know, we had a few jokes and everything over here. And, and after we relaxed, we came to re go into what is the long term need. OK, that that wasn't in the RFP. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> he started opening and explaining some of the milestones he must prove forward for, you know, for him to be trusted with more and grow this. Mm -hmm. So I actually quickly realized that I need to be invested in those milestones because his success is going to be my success, uh, very quickly. And we were able to go back with an offer that you know, responded to more needs than what actually the RFP was asking for. And I'm not talking about those boring slides in which we are a supermarket. We have 17 bullet points. Just name it. We'll put the 18th because of you. I'm not talking about those kind of slides. I'm talking about a two-pager in which we say, okay, this is the direction we can do this. But the difference is if you do it with us, we can also do this in the next quarter. Yeah. Uh, and uh, no, so I mean, I might be lucky. I might be lucky. The, the generic, <laughs> we've all seen the generic customer journey mapping, right? I mean, I think every BPO has that slide, right? Yeah. But you're absolutely right. Tailoring that to the prospect is so incredibly important and the needs of the business as well. And it also creates the opportunity, like we were talking about earlier, with solutions where now all of a sudden we can say, you know what, we had all of these support staff built in. You know what, they don't need workforce management. They have it internally, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now we can pull that resource back and we can invest that in something they do want, right? Maybe it's a technology improvement. Maybe it's, you know, a chatbot that they want to build. Maybe it's, you know, uh, they want us to go in and configure their internal systems a little bit differently, make a new IVR for them based on our experience. Or maybe we just need more team leads than what our typical ratios allow. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, 
those types of conversations are fantastic. And, you know, in fairness to all of the sales professionals out there, you know, you do not always have the opportunity to sort of circle around the RFP and have those conversations unless you have those personal relationships like you were talking about. Um, but when you do, it is so important. And I think it's also important to listen, right? Um, you know, if we're thinking about the initial submission of an RFP, that's one thing. But when you make it to that stand-up presentation and you start hearing some of the feedback from different folks within the group, the boots on the ground, the leadership team, the executive team, the purchasing team, taking those cues and giving it and using it as an option to potentially change your, your solution to amend your solution, you should take those opportunities, right? Really listen to those prospects because again, even if it's outside of the scope of the RFP, it can be that differentiator that makes them choose you. Yeah, um, and, and I admit it, I, I felt lucky and I was lucky, but if, if folks can you know, take that path and also invest time in discovering the future plans of, of a company, um, I, I guess both of our advice is go for it. So I'm just going to do a small recap about the bullet points that you've touched with respect to uh, what it takes to, you know, be a savvy seasoned and stand out kind of guy in, in sales, especially with a white glove approach, if that's okay with you. Sure. <clears throat> so you got to be creative. You got to drill for the need and bring your big boots uh, because it's going to be quite a drilling exercise. <clears throat> Sorry. You need to be diplomatic about it, how you drill, not to create tensions, but the drilling needs to go into two directions, both internally on operations side of things and both externally with, with the client. When we talk about agile and nimble, don't just say it in theory, show your agile and nimble. A lot of companies say this, but when they have to tailor or change something, pull a puzzle out, piece out, then put another one, color it differently. At the end of the day, it's not something that will fit all of the clients so you need to keep your uh, agile and nimbleness high always challenge the status quo uh, yes absolutely you said this in a different way but I, I i caught that and i'm glad you said that you know this is how things were done that's not the end of the day or the world or the system <laughs> things can be done a different way if there's the will for it and last but not least but i would start with this one is listen don't hear listen actually actively listen but you know all these skills are not something random that a person can pick up you, you might be taught that they're important you know what you might force yourself to exercise them but i want us to go back a bit into your past and see how the marketing bit and the you know the um, stints you had in this in this world actually help you sharpen some of these uh skills that you today perhaps are taking them like, you know, for breakfast, like something that is out there? I mean, so there's so many things that you can pull from marketing into sales. And I think they, you know, a lot of times I'm of the opinion and I probably share the opinion that they need to be divorced, from it, right? Mm -hmm. You need a controller of marketing, you need a controller of sales. They're united visions, but they are very, very different. Mm -hmm. Now for me, so I started out, at, you know, in sales and ad sales the mm -hmm. yellow pages the original search engine right mm -hmm. it's this big yellow book and you go to attorneys you open it up how do they get to the front of the the attorneys category you buy an ad how do you yeah but it's, it's hard to, to to stand out over there in a dull book like that <laughs> well you know for the attorneys at least they they uh here in the united states they have the for the for the criminal attorneys at least that's the only book that they get next to their one phone so they do have a bit of a captive audience from that perspective. But when you think about plumbers and roofing contractors, you're absolutely right. It is pretty boring. Um, but you've got a stated need. And it's, you know, at, at, a, at a certain time, it was the only way that people could find these folks. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, from there, I went into um, my own consultancy, basically, when mm -hmm. digital started to kill the book. Um, you know, Yellow Pages was built on a fantastic margin, right? All you have to do is print this one book. It's out there for an entire year. You know, we're talking about AT&T, SBC, some of these telco, these phone companies 
they were making 60% gross margin or even more on yeah. those books. So they were fantastic. But when digital search engine marketing, display advertising, social media advertising, Facebook meta, those types of things started to come onto the scene, all of a sudden, the biggest drumbeat from those was transparency right? Something that TV and radio and all of these other ad mediums had never done. They gave advertisers an understanding based on the auction process, how much each click would cost. And so now all of a sudden, this pricing transparency was like, well, we can't create 60% margins anymore. But at my company, the Yellow Pages, when we first started, we tried to, right? Because that was the gross margin that our investors and that our board members thought was appropriate. So I, I did that for about six to eight months before saying, you know what, I can do this myself. And, you know, we're not having people that are <laughs> opting in for the service because we're too damn expensive. Um, and from there, I started my own consultancy, Scribble Detroit, which I still maintain to this day, although it's more of an advisory capacity at this point. Um, but I worked with some really fantastic brands here locally, uh, Big Boy, uh, Mr. Rooter, which is a large plumbing company, um, Ford Motor Company, and Lincoln, uh, and had some great success working with their ad agencies and various experiential marketing ad agencies that didn't have a digital capacity, right? Yeah. So I brought the subject matter <laughs> expertise in, and I transitioned that into a career through I think six different acquisitions that ultimately landed me at Concentrix. So that Very was nice. how we made that migration to BPO. I started off as after sales marketing. So think of all the oily bits, the oil changes, brakes, batteries, tires, all of those sort of things. Quite a market. For, yeah, big brands <laughs> like Mazda, Hyundai, Honda, Ford, Kia. And, you know, I came over to an organization who had specialized in basically on-demand print postcards, you know, hey, your oil change, we know your mileage based on, you know, a complex backend algorithm, right? Or we get live mileage from telematics data in the vehicle. And we send you a postcard or we send you an email. Well, you know, at a certain point, digital was also a huge part of that. So I got to come in and, and sort of build that team and help build that operation for bringing in search engine marketing, bringing in meta, Facebook, Instagram, social advertising, to start pushing some of those things. And it was really, really cool. Um, and part of that business was also a BPO relationship where we would manage um, dealer, um, dealer interactions, parts and service, inbound contact centers. And that business was much, much larger than the marketing business. But as we know in BPO, it had much, much slimmer margins. And so when we would go through acquisition cycles, we were always put on this sort of pedestal as the marketing arm being, hey, we're the, the high margin, high value service that, oh, by the way, Mr. BPO, who's potentially buying us, you can sort of transition this and sell this to all of your other customers, right? Yeah, we're automotive focused, but we've built this platform, we've built yeah. this methodology, and you can apply it to other customers. And so I ended up at Concentrix, and that kind of started my BPO <laughs> journey to, to where I am today. Yeah, a couple of uh, points over there that I would like to go back, and that's very interesting. So basically, the timing was perfect for you because you were kind of a pioneer over here in the enlightenment revolution of how advertising is done. So that that's number one. Uh, no, number two... I think versatility was extremely important in keeping up with the new trends and uh, what you know clients are expecting to receive from marketing and you know the polarization of options out there because as you said you were coming from uh, an employer where their product was dominating the market right mm -hmm. and and suddenly there's a polarization there are certain opportunities and you know we need to take them and uh, you've also had the, this builder initiative of let's start something, let's do something, let's test something. And um, what would you say were, looking back at these three or four bullet points that I added as a summary, what do you think were the most valuable lessons from this journey of, you know, uh, alignment and revolution in marketing, uh, working on your own, uh, trying to compete with, you know, products that have, had a history and legacy over there on the market, but were dying like dinosaurs. So how did this challenge you and what did you learn? Well, I mean, let's go, let's start at the end, right? Let's start at the dinosaurs. First of all, 
that was my my first job out of college was selling mortgages like most people here in southeast michigan quicken loans is like yeah this huge <laughs> entity and so that was just telephone sales right dialing for dollars what's your rate 30 year fixed what have you so moving into advertising it was kind of crazy right because mm-hmm. Watching the death of the yellow pages, and it's not dead, and it still has its uses, and I think it's still a good yeah. vehicle for some businesses, right? But this was one of my first sales experiences, and my goals were negative, right? I oh. carried a bag of, let's say, $100,000 in MRR, and my goal for the year was to come back with 95000 only losing 5% right? Because that's how much shrinkage there was. And we were trying to make up the difference with digital products, right? And yet we were doing that at incredibly difficult margins compared to what the market would bear. And I think for me, that was sort of this genesis in my mind or this epiphany that was like, oh my goodness, we're doing things incredibly wrong. And we're I'm working for AT&T, right? This is not a small organization. This is a huge multinational company. You know, if they can get it wrong, then you know, maybe I can get it right. And, you know, I I don't know if that necessarily gave me the courage, but it certainly inspired me to go out there and say, you know what, let's try something different. Maybe I can do this on my own. And ultimately, what does the correct product look like? Now, I'm not going to say I got it right, right out of the gate. We made lots of mistakes um, along the way um, in terms of how we packaged, how we presented you know, digital was still a brand new medium. And let, I mean, let's I remember, not call them, sorry to interrupt, let's not call them mistakes, let's call them sampling. <laughs> sure, <laughs> that's fair. But like, you know, <clears throat> there were so many habits that were out there. I mean, when we start thinking of the original algorithms for like Google search or even for SEO, search engine optimization, you know, originally or initially, you had folks that were putting meta tags into their websites for every single localization they could to make sure that they would pop up when somebody would mm-hmm. search for, you know, Ford F-150 Detroit, Ford F-150 Gross Point, Ford F-150, you know, all these different municipalities and regions, right? Because those meta tags would get picked up by the very first initiations of the search engines, they would read that and they would say, this is a quality indicator saying that, yes, they do business in these towns and we should push this up the search results. And so, you know, we had so many different things that we had to sort of peel people away from. Like when you're first to market, you get rewarded with all of these benefits, right? But then slowly those benefits erode, right? Google started taking away the the benefits that they were rewarding these, these folks with because they wanted to turn them into paid advertisers. And your job as the sales executive now was to go out there and say, you know what, there's a reason why your strategies aren't working. And yeah. it is unfair, right? <laughs> this company wants to make money now, right? And they are changing the rules. And yes, it does seem greedy, but here's how we can make things better. And here's how we need to help you to reach your prospects in the future and sort of transition that mindset from how we beat the system to how we work within the system. Um, So it it, it was, you know, early digital was a very, very interesting time. I mean, and and, and thinking about it through an automotive lens or an automotive perspective, you had three different businesses. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a hundred different businesses within an automotive manufacturer, but just thinking about the delivery channels, right? We call them tier one, tier two, tier three. Mm-hmm. Tier one is the manufacturer. Mm-hmm. Tier two, at least here in the United States, it's a little bit different. We're country to country, but tier two here in the United States are these huge groups of dealers, regional groups. Mm-hmm. And those are the folks that they gather a little bit of money off the sale of every vehicle and they can make bigger sponsorship buys. They can buy TV advertising. They can do a little bit more than just one dealer on their own. So it's sort of a coalition of dealers working together. And then you have the dealer themselves. And so you would have a really fantastic opportunity or an understanding at, let's say, the tier one level that when you boil down to the tier three level, maybe only 15 percent of the dealership body understood. Mm -hmm. And so when you're creating packages and when you're doing things and selling things through, you know, all three channels and having to tailor your approach to each audience, it can be really, really challenging because not every person is going to have 
the investment to understand, right? They're not going to have a dedicated marketing person or even a dedicated marketing team um, to go through and do that. So, you know, it, it, it definitely shows some challenges from, from both operations and from sales. I think I'm taking away here the fact that there's no such thing that that's the always right method or the always correct way to do it. And, no, you uh, have to be flexible. <clears throat> And I'm coming back to, you know, nimble and agile. And uh, I'm coming back to uh, one example you gave. And guys, multinationals can be so wrong about it. They can be so rigid about it that by the time they finish the study, feasibility study, and the approvals to the bureaucratic chains, uh, it no longer might be on vogue to actually, uh, you know, uh, ring the bell and say we're offering this service. So as Paul did over here, you might taking it on your own, it might seem a bit crazy and risky. It has its you know pitfalls over there, but it can be ultra rewarding in a, in a six months, one year journey, as opposed to waiting for the multinational you're working in to actually take action uh, in that direction. And um, working with these tools, but not only these tools, when we talk about marketing and, and, and different segments, tools, ways, uh, applications, uh, environments to do marketing, as Paul experienced in this revolution, uh, they're always going to be like a living organ organism. They're, they're constantly going to grow and morph and change, and, and that needs to happen with us also because <clears throat> if you don't keep up, you're falling behind. And when you're in the, you know, in the private path kind of way, entrepreneurship kind of way, you, you can't risk to fall behind because you're going to run out of clients and out of money. And that's a very sad scenario. So you constantly need to be uh, up to date and understand that if change frustrates you as a as a, an expert or as a consultant, right? Consulting company, if change frustrates you, just imagine what that does to your clients, which thought that if they put that hashtag over there, that's it. That's that's where the marketing revolution ends. And from there, it's going to be pouring money and pouring sales. That's it. So you can imagine the white glove approach needed over here for actually going back and saying, listen, you're going to have to pump money in this. Listen, you're going to pump money and there will be months in which you don't sell. Listen, if you don't do that, you won't have any traffic and so on and so forth. So I'm guessing it's not easy uh, nowadays also, Paul. But, uh, you know, sometimes the advantage of something new happening is that uh, people maybe might be more patient with the with it without knowing entirely what does it require or expect? Well, and you you've got you know to your point you've got different stakeholders, right? I'll use a really one of my favorite examples, and we had and this was when I was at Concentrix, but before it was Concentrix, before we were acquired, we had a fantastic team in Canada, great account manager. She was just awesome, had wonderful relationships with um, Mazda over there. Mm -hmm. And so they, they gave us a little bit of leeway to be able to do some cool and, and fun marketing ideas, right? And, and again, great client, great account management team, willing to push the boundaries, right? And so we put together a campaign. It was featured actually by Facebook as a case study in automotive. Um, we ended up selling about the same amount of vehicles as in, in, in I think a quarter, I think it was three months, that one dealership in Canada sells the entire year on average. And Whoa. The, the, the bright side, I mean, there was a lot of bright side, right? Our sales pen rate was fantastic. I mean, we were, we were doing matchbacks directly to a sale in a time where analytics and digitals, particularly with social media advertising, wasn't great. Um, but the, the hook, what we were doing essentially was we were saying, hey, you come in for a test drive, we'll give you a gas card. So they got a gift card. And so we were driving the dealerships fucking crazy. You know, they were having, you know, for every sale they were making, which is really positive, they had a bunch of people that were coming in and just wanted gas cards, right? They wanted the gift. They wanted, hey, yeah, I'll, I'll hop in a brand new car and take it around the block if you give me 25 bucks to, to the local gas station, right? Even if I don't have a car, I can go buy snacks or whatever, you know? Yeah. And um, so it, it was trying to find the, the medium point. And we actually, we, we got it pretty down, right? It, what we found is the secret, and for all of my marketing folks that might be watching this, the, the secret really was the input, right? 
what we had to do on the front end to give them the code to be able to go into the dealership and take that test drive and get that gas card, what we found is we just needed to ask for more information. The more invasive we were as marketers, the further down the purchase funnel we, we drove, right? It's one thing if you're just handing out gas cards right at the front desk. Oh, yeah, I'll do it all day. But if I ask for your first name, your last name, your email address, you know, what car you prefer, give me a trim level on your that. Your social that. profile, yeah, kind of, kind of a building a, a, a persona, a client persona over there and see, you know, what would be the return from that. Because when it comes to free riders, I'm sure you can spend a, tr a tremendous amount of money on gifts and on all kind of coupons. And at the end of the day, left with nothing just because, yeah, you know, I mean, the executive really thought it be... was cool. And that was the manufacturer too. I mean, they're obviously very cognizant of what the return on investment yeah. is, right? If they're spending a gazillion dollars in gas cards, now all of a sudden it doesn't make sense. But no, it was a fantastic opportunity. And that came from, to our earlier bullet point, that came from challenging the status quo, trying some things that are different, um, you know, having that use case. And I'll tell you, you know, as a sales professional, taking that idea that was incredibly successful, incredibly mm -hmm. profitable, that worked for all parties, there are definitely OEMs that I talked to that were not willing to what they saw as perceived risk, right? What happens if we give away too many gas cards? What happens if yeah. we don't have sales? How do we control this process? And we would show all the different ways that we would do it, but you just have that risk aversion that's out there. And that, again, creates differentiation in the manufacturers themselves, who's going to be successful and who's not. Yeah, you talked about risk aversion over there. And uh, I was I was curious, uh, in your case, if you felt that working on your own and taking this path and uh, no longer being an employee has, has taught you to think more like you have skin in the game when you're working with the client's budget. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. And, you know, to be fair, I am 100% an employee now, but I think if you're a salesperson, regardless of who you're working for, yeah. you are always working for yourself, right? You, your compensation, I mean, in, in some of my earlier jobs, I would say it was 80-20. My base salary was 20%. My commissions were 80%, yeah. right? So forget about goals that your employer provides you. I need to make money, right? I, that, I'm my own business. You need to have your and own so, goals. Absolutely. I mean, you, you, you just by having a car payment, you've got your own goals, right? Just by having an apartment right. or a house, you've got right. your own goals. But, um, you know, working alongside that, you need to be able to create opportunity for yourself. There's certainly organizations out there that give you inbound leads and those types of things. But at the end of the day, you eat what you kill and you have to go out there and you have to find opportunity. And you can't always do that if you follow the company playbook 100%. You have to go out there and find niches, especially, you know, working with startups or working with BPOs that maybe aren't like Concentrics that has a gazillion employees and, you know, 30 million sites across the globe. You're going out there and you're saying, okay, how do I differentiate and how can I create, you know, verticals or, or opportunities within what we're doing, right? So you've got sort of all of these puzzle pieces and those puzzle pieces are your existing clients. And you say, okay, how can I make these referenceable? How can I create a story that's going to resonate with my prospect and give me the authenticity to move to that next level of conversation, whether that's an RFP or a proposal or, or, or whatever that might be. Right. And so, you know, part of that is ignoring the status quo. And part of that is just sort of reading the tea leaves, right? Just yep. understanding that, okay, where have I had success in my career and how can I duplicate or replicate that success? And for those people who might be listening who haven't had success before, where has my company had success, right? You don't have to invent things all the time. Innovation is probably more important than invention, right? Yep. Taking what others have done before you and making it just a little bit better. Um, you know, Streamline it. Yeah, we talked about, you know, again, you know, what make what are the differentiators, what makes you a good salesperson, those types of things. You know, a lot of that is having a consultative approach, which goes back to those asking those fact-finding questions. But part of that is just going the extra mile, right? If you think about a presentation or a proposal or how you're interacting with a prospect, you know, if you're going out there and sending a gazillion emails every day trying to get somebody to pick up the 
the phone, you're making a bunch of phone calls every single day. How can you make that conversation just a little bit different? And, you know, I, I know it, as salespeople, we're inundated with these examples of somebody like, you know, put a meme in your in your email or, or try to be more fun or, you know, that stuff is is fine. But I've always defaulted to how can I provide more value, right? How can I make what I'm saying or what I'm proposing or why I'm asking for what I'm asking for better? And a lot of that is bringing experience into it, doing the research before you reach out to the prospect. Again, even if you can't have that conversation, there's a lot of pain points that are self-evident on a website, right? For a BPO, I'll go through the chat box, right? Yeah. Just, hey, pretend you're a customer, right? Call into their Or call the line. Yeah. <clears throat> is, is the IPR good? Do you have, you know, the United States is the fifth largest Spanish-speaking nation in the world. Do yeah. they have a prompt for Spanish? You know, a lot of customers that that we've added Spanish speakers to their, their service line, they say, oh, well, we don't have any Spanish customers. You know, they, it's never not. Well, you never gave your customers the option. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> would you be willing to test? I, I, I would go back with a question and say, would you be willing to test for 30 days? You would be surprised <laughs> how many Spanish customers do you have. Of course, they, of course, they need to speak English if you don't provide that, right? So they're going to be English speaking. Um, yeah. You know, all of a sudden you're creating that, you know, <clears throat> when we think of CSAT and Net Promoter Score and we think about all those things in that customer journey for yeah. return customer, if you've cut, let's say, one fifth of your customer base out or 10% of your customer base out, I mean, that's a huge amount depending on the business. And they can't communicate with you. They can't have a conversation with you. Are they going to repurchase with you? Are they going to continue to subscribe with you? And, you know, I'm sure as I've seen and you've seen in your career, the breakage is significant. Yeah. And you know what? If, if it would have been some sort of niche rare language, I wouldn't understand. You know, I would say, okay, it, it, the pool talent is so small, so scarce, uh, you know, this downside of the cost over there. But it's such a vast and huge population out there speaking Spanish, looking for jobs, uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's kind of such a low hanging fruit that it just shows that you're not interested at the end yeah. of the day. It's, so a, you, to your you point, it's a signal to your customer. <clears throat> exactly. And I was, uh, I was thinking about the metaphor you used over there. You eat what you hunt or what you kill. <laughs> and, uh, no, I think that's, that's very true. I just, uh, I think lately, uh, I've been in several occasions where, you know, people that I don't work with were in a conundrum and needed some advice and needed some pointing and, and, and needed some consulting. And uh, I just found it that sometimes if you if we take this into a fishing metaphor, we just catch and release. I think that fish, you know, when they're actually going to be ready for the fishermen to actually catch them, they're going to come back to that specific fisherman remembering that trust component. And, and that brought in an arms component that, you know, uh, there were some difficult times and this is a, someone that has helped me and I can build a relationship of trust. I didn't do this intentionally, don't get me wrong. I just, I just thought like, you know, it's such a low hanging fruit for me to actually help with this that it would mean a lot for the others. It would take me like 15 minutes to stop and just listen and help, right? Uh, and this is yeah, also... Uh, to that, I mean, I don't know if this is a survivorship bias, but I have absolutely, to your point, you know, you've got a customer who comes to you, a client who you've got a great relationship with you and with, and they say, hey, I've got this solution. It's not yours. It's with another company. What do you think about this? Right. Yeah. And, you know, you can just, I think the default position, particularly in sales is you, you're like, oh, don't do it. It's crap. You know, it's not what I'm selling you. Right. And I think that completely invalidates all of your credibility as a trusted resource, right? Yeah. Your prospect is coming to you for advice. Potentially, they're already a customer of yours, and you're going to sit there and just immediately default trash. It's like, no, you should absolutely sort of tease apart what that is. In some cases, it will be trash, right? I'm not saying you need to, to prop up another <laughs> a competitor's product or service, but I think what, what is hidden in there is a need right? Or a goal that they're trying to solve for. And you're not going to be able to solve every, every need. You know, again, if we're not working at some of these huge big box stores that have a million different acquisitions and a million different solutions, 
you know, we can be li limited in sort of our exposure or what we're able to do. Um, but if we don't provide realistic advice or counsel, <clears throat> then again, we've completely invalidated our credibility and we're in a situation where that prospect isn't going to trust us again. And to your point, I've had so many of those fish come back and say, you know what? This was good, like you said it was going to be good. And this was bad, like you said it was going to be bad. And we'd like to try something different. Do you think your company could do this? And now all of a sudden I've created an opportunity for myself. Of course, it took me a few years you know, to streamline this process and understand that you don't need to criticize, but rather show how you would do things differently. Or, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I had a long day today talking a lot. Um, <laughs> And, you know, showing that you are genuinely thinking of how you could do this better as if it would be your skin in the game or you would have to wear those shoes. And as I said, I didn't do it intentionally. So I discovered this by, by, by randomness, to say so, by pure luck, right? I said, again, low-hanging fruit for me. I'm a pretty open guy. I, I, I like what I do. I talk constantly about what I do, so why not help others, right? And uh, I came to realize that, you know, instead of criticize, criticizing, once you focus on what you can do better, it also shows that differentiator if they would eventually work with you. And as you said, you know, I, I was surprised. So, so one of them was, and it's completely shocking. So I got a phone call after six years. And uh, I was told, you know what, I, I was thinking a lot of what you said back then, but we didn't have the capital. So after six years, I managed to find the capital. Uh, do, do you think we can start exploring again? <laughs> I was like, okay, I, mean, I, I thought you were dead. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the difference too, you know, and we, I, I should put context to my role in, right? I'm, I'm an enterprise salesperson, right? Yeah. In, in particular, when we think about BPO, that means that we're talking about deals that are typically 25, 50 plus yeah, 50 agents plus right, agents, that we're yeah. staffing. The sales cycle on these opportunities is not two months, right? Yeah. We don't, you know, we, we absolutely have sales goals that it's like, hey, this quarter you're responsible for this much revenue. But when we think about how I drive revenue as a salesperson, you know, I might have one deal that yeah. carries my entire year that's that significant. And so to your point about somebody coming back after six years, I've had people come from the initial discussion we had was at a different company. They were at a completely different company when they called me back. And they said, you know what? I loved it. My leadership team wasn't ready at the time. I'm the leadership team now because I've taken a promotion with another organization. Let's go to work. How can we make this work for my, ne my next company? It's uh, it, it, as particularly an enterprise, you have to consider your personal brand. Again, going back to, hey, I am employed, but I am not an employee, right? You have to consider your personal brand and yeah. you have to consider how that translates to, again, how you build those relationships because those, you know, it's a little bit different than sort of a referral, but it is basically a referral, right? How how that is going to fill your pipeline for decades yeah. potentially to come? Yeah, I feel the same way. I really believe that each of us has their own brand and their own business card, and I think people follow people. And if I look back in my career, I mean, regardless regardless with whom I worked or where did I go or where did I end up? I mean, there were just people and said, listen, I, I want to work because we did that, did this, that, and the other. And I know your personality, your character, your way of thinking. Uh, and, and that's your personal brand. When people call you like this guy did with you and say, you know, I'm in leadership right now and I want to work with you. That's, that's a very positive feedback. So when you do things, guys, even if you're employees, do them like you would do them for yourself. Right. Or, that, or if you, yeah, if, if you don't respect yourself, because it can be that situation when you do things for yourself, you don't care, you just want to go through them, then do it like for a higher entity. Okay. Like for a higher power or <laughs> think of it as your highest creation. Okay. Because eventually what you deliver will be again your business card and someone will notice. Okay. I, I haven't met anyone who wasn't noticed eventually. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. It might take 30 years, but you're going to get noticed eventually. So use this uh, business card. Well, you're, you're, 
your higher power can be your family, right? I mean, that type of, uh, you know, moral standing, yep. that type of uh, position that you take. Correct. That credibility translates to all of your relationships, not just your business relationships. I think that it should always, always, always be consistent. Um, you know, I, I, I think, too, on, on the reverse side, too, yep. talking about great habits, but talking about bad habits, too. Mm -hmm. I had somebody early on in my career who told me, you know, who gave me that this pearl of advice, but it's something that I've carried with me. You know, mm. work is that that group project in college or high school that, uh, you know, you've, you've got somebody who's pulling more than their own weight. You've got somebody who's not even showing up and you've got a couple of people that are just adding the bare minimum, right? And, yeah. and work is like that 100% <laughs> of the time. But that said, even the person who's not showing up, there's opportunity to learn from those people, right? There have been people that I've come in conflict in my with in my career. There's people who I don't admire their work ethic, or I don't think that the way they do things necessarily. But there is a reason why they're at your organization, right? And you can learn either what not to do, yep. or what they do. And so value every single relationship that you have in business, because there's no one person who can't teach you something. And, um, you know, I, I really, I carry that with me. I've had <laughs> several instances of people who I was like, what is the value of this person in the organization? And really just by thinking through that, either for they're a net negative or, hey, you know what? They are a net positive, but they're a net positive at this or at this or something else that I didn't consider. It really helps me to understand both my prospects and sort of maybe some of their motivations for why mm -hmm. they're wanting what they want or what their goals are as well as how to inspire people on your team, right? Because again, in sales, you are that matchmaker. You know, you are responsible for operations. There's no one time where I just get to say, all right, the contract is signed. See you guys later, right? I'm constantly managing that relationship because I want that person to be an, a, 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 a proponent of me for my yeah. entire career, for their entire career, right? And so I think just like, you know, and even back to active listening, just being there to understand, to listen, to learn is so, so important because you know what? At the end of the day, you're there anyway. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And time passes by anyway, right? So, but at the end of the day, who is Paul in 2024 versus Paul in 2020? Is there sure. a morphing process that's happening? Are we getting better? Are we going to be more connoisseurs in our domain, a better person, a better father, so on and so forth? And I was, uh, you know, grasping some thoughts while you were uh, mentioning all these uh, experiences. And I was going a bit back to the key questions that the key question that I get in general is like, should I open a business? And, you know, I, I, I don't want to be any party pooper over there and, and just say, you know, no. But I, I, I've, I've actually challenged people. Not you know, what looking in the mirror and thinking and testing your motivation, testing your passion that didn't really work well. So I, I say yes now, but I add two con two conditions. So everybody that asks me this, I say yes, but I add two conditions. Okay, uh, maybe three. Uh, one of them would be to work for someone else and shadow someone that is great at what they want to do. Because I think it's extremely valuable to have some mentors over there, you know, get some contacts, show some people that you have some muscles, you can do something. Then in the middle of this journey, I would pray that I would have at least a team lead that sucks. So I would <laughs> learn, yeah, I would learn what not to do. Okay? I think that's very fair. Yeah. And I would say two point, that was 2.1. And 2.2, or number three, as you want to call it, um, would be... Make sure that team lead that sucks tests you so much from so many angles that by the end of the day, you're not confusing your business for just a lust to do something and you're actually passionate about it. I think that's very good. I mean, as a business owner, it is imperative that you understand that you do not get to do the thing that you like most about that business. You mm -hmm. have to do all of the things that are inherent in that business. And to your point, there's going to be things that you suck at, right? Just, hey, it happens, right? Um, you know, 
I was a one man show for a lot of, yep. of my early career. And so that means you're the accountant. That means you're the salesperson. That means or the lawyer the operations. Yeah. You're the contractor, right? Yeah. A contract expert. Um, and so, you know, passion is only <laughs> going to carry you so far, you know, Hey, I love doing this or I love, you know, you, you really have to say, am I comfortable managing all of these other things? And is it something that ultimately I want to get into? Because, you know, working for yourself is fantastic, but, you know, certainly it comes with different challenges. Yeah. And if you're not prepared to meet those challenges, then, you know, there's options for you to be an employee as well. But I think those are great. I think those are great pearls of wisdom. I think that particularly talking about having a team lead that sucks is great. Right. Like how, knowing, going in there and being able to be critical and, and, and evaluate your criticism, too. Right. Are these yeah. personality clashes? Right. I've had a lot of people who I've had personality clashes with who are fantastic. Right. There is no question that their operational leadership, the things that they do are the best. Right. So are you able to evaluate what makes somebody a bad team lead or not a bad team lead? Right. Um, yeah. I think making sure that you're not making shallow evaluations is super important. And, um, you know, I think we all have are going to have biases within our own internal narratives. But maintaining that objectivity, particularly when it comes to business, is one of those key differences between success and failure. Yeah, I feel the same way. So <clears throat> I'm no longer discouraging people or sending them back to the mirror to look and, and, and do a deep dive into their, uh, you know, own personality and character because that can be easily biased or misinterpreted in a favorable way to give you the yes answer. So I just ask them to do this for 12 months, 12 months, uh, you know, 18 months. So you can spend six months with a boss that sucks, right? So <laughs> it's not going to be only rainbows. Um, so, Paul, I think now is the right time to go a bit into the challenges of actually being a um, part of a sales division in the BPO industry. Um, and, you know, even though we're talking about large clients, corporations, big brands, global market, and, and in fact, the competition is fierce. You're not only competing because you're in the U.S., you're competing globally with someone else that sells the same service, maybe at a lower buck over there. And we know that the BPO industry is an industry where the margin adds an incredible pressure. I'm not saying there are not others, but this one is pretty special about it. What else would be, you know, the, the challenges in this industry from your experience? Well, I mean, being part of a, a, a sales organization, I think, you know, expectations are always the enemy, right? And I don't know that enemy is the right thing, but they're what you're going to come up against, right? There's mm -hmm. expectations from your own leadership team. There's expectations from your clients. There's expectations from your delivery. I mean, you are that sort of focal point that ties all of those entities together. And so that is a huge challenge, I think, for people, because maybe you're only good at one or two of those negotiations, mm -hmm. but you really have to be good at all of those negotiations. And the, the nice part about it is really breaking it down to fundamentals and understanding that in most cases, the expectations are pretty similar, whether they're revenue expectations, cost expectations, or for operations, margin expectations, right? And so... As a salesperson, really, it's going through and understanding how you can bring value to each one of those parties. So for your leadership team, it's easy, right? Go sell something, right? Yeah. For your client, it's, you know, again, we get in these traps where it's just like, I just need to make it a buck cheaper. I'm going to go back to operations. What can we trim out of here to get me this extra dollar? Because I swear if I could just get a dollar cheaper, I, I'm, it, it's a done deal. Well, again, working at some of the largest BPOs and some of the absolute smallest BPOs, I've sold on both ends of those price spectrum. And price is just not, not the reason why somebody picks you ever. It's how do we make that price? Have you heard that, guys? Uh, sorry, Go I ahead. interrupt you. I'm, I'm just asking the guys that are constantly saying they can't sell because there's a lower sales price. I'm asking them if they're listening to this episode or if they hear this. 
<laughs> Sorry, Paul. Well, and also a, a shout out to all my salespeople that say that, hey, if I just had one, uh, uh, the best one pager ever created, it would open a million doors for me too. And that's sort of that divestment between marketing and sales, right? Marketing, if you could just make me a Venn diagram in the perfect colors <laughs> with the best logo that says all of these points, it would be the difference between, you know, 60 appointments a, a month and zero appointments a month. <laughs> Um, yeah. And so like, yeah, I'll air some of sales, dirty laundry on top of that too. But, you know, it's really yeah. never been different than going to those fundamentals and understanding what that value is. And the way to get that understanding is to have those conversations and to be able to dig deep, like you said earlier, get your boots on understand what that customer is truly looking for and then having honest conversations with your ops team and probing them like how can we deliver this how can we do this better what you know and and more and more so i will say as well this might be a different spin on it because we do put a lot of pressure on ops which in turn ops always puts a lot of pressure on sales too right but uh technology right we now it, it, particularly in BPO with AI and the things that are mm -hmm. coming down the pipe and things that we've talked about, gosh, forever. I mean, AI yep. really hasn't been the change of this conversation. It's just a little bit different words that we're using, right? Automation has always been there, right? L0. How can we deflect more tickets, more customers without losing our, our CSAT yep. score? And, and so in your solutions, now you have a new party to bring in, right? Um, I think some companies try to lump them in with operations, but your technical team too, right? Um, I've had technical teams that are great in front of clients, but by and large, you've got technical teams that aren't necessarily great at talking to clients, right? And so yeah. the biggest fear of a client when you start bringing a technical solution in like an FAQ or a chat bot or, or some other sort of L0 a smart IVR component into it is they say, oh my goodness, okay, this is going to take a million points of data. I'm going to have to get parts of my company, particularly at a multinational where it's a huge, big company. I've got to bring in additional stakeholders. Like, I don't want to do any of that. So your job now is to make sure that you make that process as easy as possible. So you have to really work with that team to make sure that they're putting their foot best foot forward and making it not seem like you're bringing in a huge chore for that client, but it's truly a value add and something that they can accomplish in a reasonable frame of time. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, uh, the, the sooner we understand uh, these nuances that were discussed in the past 10 to 15 minutes, I think the better for us because we, otherwise we'll be hitting ourselves against a wall which we, we, we can't destroy, right? At the end of the day, if you don't keep up with these, if you don't listen, if you're not agile, if you're not considerate, if you're not a, a good liaison between stakeholders, a good buffer between stakeholders, right? Because you might come with full of bruises from the punches that you receive from the client. But that doesn't mean you got to keep throwing the punches yourself at the end of the day, right? Uh, you're, you're not going to have that chemistry and not be able to maximize most of the relationships that are needed to be cultivated for the overall success, which is tied to your commission or your uh, success within uh, a company or with a client. And um, I want us to talk about the uh, lessons you've learned during the pandemic, especially in this industry, and also about what's happening right now with the recession. There are a lot of you know important lessons also over there, especially how people are losing jobs and you know uh, everything that's happening over there, the panic. But I also want us to touch a bit uh, the chapter or the topic of being Teflon, anti-redundancy anti Teflon Kevlar vest you can have over there as an employee uh, in sales and what you can try to do things, you know, differently to actually go through this uh, dark period. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll answer the first one because for sales, it's really easy, right? Your, your Teflon vest, your bulletproof vest is the revenue opportunities that you create. That's the reason why I love doing sales, right? I like not having any sort of ambiguity based on my performance, right? What I bring in is what I bring in. Yeah. And, you know, the sort of swagger that I get to have or carry throughout my relationship is with, with my company, with my employer, is purely based on performance 
performance, right? There's no room for negotiation there. I will say, though, I mean, there's always uh, situations that arise where mm -hmm. you've got, you know, you could be bringing in, you could be hitting your goals, but you're still not jiving with that employer. And I would say, you know, part of that is to, again, you know, we're going back to digging deep, but you have to really understand what your employer is looking for. Yeah. Um, and and there, there's, there's always going to be tasks that you don't like <clears> to do. Um, but making sure that you can execute on those tasks, you never want to be, when we talk about challenging the status yeah. quo and challenging solutions, that's one thing, right? But when you're just saying like, I don't want to do this, or, you know, this isn't the way that I do business and those, that kind of shit makes you just a, a pain in the ass and nobody wants to work with you. So, you know, there, there's, there's, I don't know if it's a fine line. I think it's a huge, big, fat, glaring line. But remember, you know, people want to do business with people they want to do business with. And if you're a giant pain in the ass, both from a prospecting perspective and internally, then you're not going to get the best out of your ops people. And that all, doesn't always mean you have to be pleasant as punch, but you do have to really understand what those pain points of the organization are and how best to be able to fill them. Um, so that's that one. The pandemic has been very interesting. I, um, just between owning my own business and working where I've worked, um, I've been remote for 10 plus years. I've been remote way before it was in vogue to be remote. You're kind and of so a remote that, alien, aren't you? From a far <laughs> galaxy. A little bit. I mean, like when I first, you know, talking about the marketing and coming over, the first thing that we sold at the new company from automotive perspective mm -hmm. was, I think it was like 450 different dealer campaigns for a manufacturer. And I was in my basement. We didn't have operations yet. We didn't have the yeah. revenue to get operations people yet. So I made 450 times two because it was a search engine marketing package and it was a Facebook package in my basement, you know, by myself. So <laughs> I've gone from sort of gremlin to now everybody's remote. You get to have a little bit of, uh, of fun with it. But, you know, the pandemic has, has changed significantly how we sell, right? I mean, so much more is remote, remote, right? I'm not traveling as much as I used to. Um, I'm not going as nearly as many site visits, you know, from mm -hmm. a BPO perspective, so many of our operations now are remote. So there's not a really necessarily an office that we're showing off. Right. Um, typically, I still like to do site visits. I think, particularly for an enterprise client, that's one of the best closing mechanisms that you can have as a salesperson. Yeah. If you've got great ops people, if you've got great teams with great stories to tell, man, put them in front of your prospects. Let help them. Yeah, a round table. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you can say that your attrition is low but they can feel how low that attrition is because they can feel that love from your team when they're in front of them explaining, you know, why they like to work, why they like to work on the project they're working for, what their success factors are, all of that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, doing just a ton less travel. Um, your prospecting is much less, you know, I used to go to a lot of different events and, you know, the, budget for those events and the travel budget for those <clears throat> events and really the ROI on those events aren't really as nice as they used to be. You don't have as many decision makers that are going out to these events and apologies for any event people that are listening to this. But many times this is used as I'm, I'm sure they know it. <laughs> many times this is used as professional development. So you've got very junior people there that are, you know, taking the place of the prospect, whereas it used to be senior members that like to get out. And this was their one time a year to go to Vegas or to go to Florida or go somewhere warm or fun. Um, so, you know, you really have now a new, you know, going on LinkedIn to prospect, sending emails. But I, I think the Don Draper you know, days are gone. Yes. I will tell you, you know, don't be afraid to pick up the phone still, by the way. I mean, it's one of the main ways that we still interact and we deliver from a BPO perspective. Why would it be any different for your prospects, right? You know, yes, chatbots are important. Yes, that L0 is green and growing. But we all know how we feel as a customer when we get taken care of on the phone with a live agent who speaks our language and the dialect that we're used to with a high level of care. And you should be aspired to be the same thing as a sales executive. 
And so, you know, picking up that phone, making those connections, you know, it's not always about cold calling, right? I think referral, particularly at enterprise, is important, you know. It, it, it's never, hey, I'm calling into the main 1-800 number and asking for the CEO, right? But, hey, who do I know that knows that person that can help put me in front of that person so that we can have a conversation or so that we can schedule a meeting? Um, and, you know, that ultimately, you know, flows through to how we build those relationships now. It's much more digital. So that means that you need to be touching your clients a little bit more, right? You're not going to see them quarterly at CCW, right? You're not going to see your clients um, for QBRs as much anymore because even those are sort of remote, right? So you need to make sure that you're picking up the telephone, right? That you're taking social cues about what their kids are doing. You know, it's not always a call to say, hey, did you see our SLAs this month? They're fantastic, right? It can be picking up the phone to just say, hey, you know, I know your son or daughter just had a big, you know, fill in the blank game or something like that. How did everything go? Um, you know, I thought I saw this note and thought of you guys, you know, here's some industry uh, tidbit that's been floating around. I wanted to get your take on it because it really impacts yep. your particular business. All of those things can be great ways to sort of keep that touch base up. And it doesn't need to be every week. But, you know, typically speaking, if you haven't talked to your existing client or your, your prospective client once a month, you're probably doing something wrong. And oh, by the way, as a sales executive, even an enterprise sales yep. executive, getting on ops calls is not beneath you. Oh, you know, this is calls. really nice. Really good one. Kudos. We, I, I, out of the last, let's say, 250 ops calls, I don't, I don't, I think I, I, I but you were not in that company. <laughs> so I missed you there, but I don't think I've seen the others. This is no, gold. I mean, this is gold. Your, your, your clients certainly at an enterprise level are the C-suite, right? Are the directors, the VPs, the mm -hmm. SVPs. But, you know, your clients are also the people that are working with your day-to-day -day teams, right? And your clients are your day-to-day -day teams, right? If, you're, if your team internally are pissed off and they fucking hate the work and your attrition is miserable and you're not doing something to analyze or understand that, then you're doing something wrong. And so I always try to get, you know, again, once a month in the early stages, I'm on yeah. as many as I possibly can be on. But, you know, let's say it's steady state, year two, whatever. I'm still trying to get in there once a month. I love I, back in the days where we would all travel for quarterly business reviews. I loved that. That was when I sold the most stuff. Right. Because it's an action item driven conversation. It's performance based. There's always problems that are brought up. And there's always opportunities for solutions to be presented. And so in lieu of that post-pandemic, your ops calls are your QBRs. Yep. You're, you're presenting the SLAs, right? You're talking about challenges and successes. And I'll tell you, your ops team isn't always editorializing those the way that you would as a sales professional, right? It, you know, I've got team leads or QA folks that are presenting SLAs and saying, yeah, we're 108 percent to goal for the eight months in a row, and then they move on to the next. It's like, whoa, oh, stop! Hey, eight months in a row? Yeah, that's pretty fantastic, right? What are we doing that's leading to that? Well, what and, do you and, think and, we're doing, right? Even if he doesn't know, maybe he has some ideas. Do you think this can be replicated in other uh, directions? I think, yeah, I think it's quite it's it's quite interesting what you're pointing out. Again, I, I think I've I've used so many times in this conversation. Um, the words listen, the words adapt more, uh, give your client what he or she actually asks, and, and also proactiveness, right? I think this is another word for what we've talked so far. Don't, don't do things reactive, right? Like things went south, I need to be in that ops call. I need to be in that, uh, you know, uh, client call. If that's because the only time they see you, then again, you completely removed your authenticity or your trust factor right like yeah. absolutely yeah and uh you know re regardless of 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 those go i i call them governance call right you can call them wbrs qbrs monthly uh business reviews i i, I call them governance calls and we, when we didn't have to touch you know the topic of an agenda with that client we would just spar so what do i what do i mean by sparring like you know, how are things going on your side? You know, how are you dealing with that kind of pressure? 
what's going on? Again, I'm I'm not a salesperson. I, I I'm I'm not uh, I'm not considering myself a sales connoisseur, but I'm just building on the uh, idea that you mentioned about investing your time and attention and focus by actually listening who that client is, who that person is. You know, did did they watch football? Did they drink beer? Uh, you know, you know, did, did they have like a major event in their life lately? Um, people, people do business with people they yep. want to do business with. And if your entire interaction is only business deep, you're going to be churning and burning customers and clients your entire career. You have to dig deep. You have to have those conversations. And listen, not everybody's going to want to share their entire family life with you, right? Correct, you're not going to know correct, their wife's correct. name necessarily. But I promise you, there is something they will share something. that they're going to bring up that you can zero in on, that you can start building that relationship to be more than just work. Because if they have to see you every week, whether it's your ops team or your sales team or your delivery team or whatever team, <laughs> they they don't want to go to a boring meeting either, right? <laughs> they don't want to they don't want it to pot constantly be a, a a bitch session either. And I'll tell you, you know, and I don't I, I'd love to get your take on this, but something yeah. that I've noticed in the industry, I think that account management, true account management, has been something that most big box BPOs are trying to commoditize. I think they are trying to put push that wage. That was a position that was always a six-figure position. That was a big opportunity with a fat bonus tied to it. And you had true professionals that were in there after sales to sort of take that from cradle to grave, right? And they were responsible for account growth. And those are your farmers and sales is your hunters, right? And I have seen a trend where account management has been pushed more and more to I don't know, like program management, right? They're they're managing action items. They're just there to be the scribe. It's, it's very sad. Meeting. It's very sad what you're seeing. And actually, well, one of my uh, my let's say very blunt and, and open conversation, candid with radical candor uh, conversations that I had with a CEO, I, I told him that I would fire everyone in account management and not hire someone in that role unless they had operational experience. Because if you're forcing sales and expecting for sales to have a white glove approach, proactive approach with a client, then someone needs to do it with delivery also. And that's where the Absolutely. art of account management comes in. Uh, the way I see it, again, it's a subjective definition of, of the role over here, but trying to stretch someone from sales into both roles now that is one of the latest atrocities that I've seen that is is backfiring and and as you said yeah there was an investment I I I call it an investment with these folks because the noise you know the noise was low when you had these guys because they would know how to absorb right and not only how to absorb because it's not like you absorb that noise and okay the client now has ventilated Let's move on with our lives. What happens, they would start with the RCA. They would start drilling. They would start going to the root cause. Why did that noise occur? When you don't have that person and you're tra trying to take a shortcut, how can you sell Paul if I haven't solved the root cause of that noise? How can you sell? Well, and it's it's this obsession too. And I think, you know, even drilling down past account management to, you know, agent and productive hour, right? I mean, we're all trying to get the very max out of our agents at all time. And I think in some ways that has reduced effectiveness of the agents because they're constantly trying to evaluate that, right? Well, I think the same thing is true for sales. And I think the same thing is true for account management, right? You're looking from, an, from a leadership perspective at where you can trim and where you can optimize your organization. And let's face it, account managers sort of exist in these two polar opposites, right? They're there to present all the good news and hopefully make growth sales off of it. And they're there to when when shit goes sideways and they're there to to deliver the bad news, right? And 80% sort of, of their work is that it, yes. regardless of and the so industry. They're like, well, you know, what about the in-between? What are you doing with your time? And it's like mm -hmm. you could be new logo selling, or you could be, it's like, listen, dude. You have to understand that neither sales or account management is a true 40 hour a week type role, right? It is feast or famine. There are times where you're not doing anything and there's times where you're working 24 hours a day for a week and a half straight. 
And I think that this push towards constant productivity has sort of eliminated some of the art behind these two very critical roles where now all of a sudden, because I can see how many times you're on the laptop or how many communications you've sent or what meetings you, you know, and, and, and I'm trying to do that sort of analysis, you've lost sort of that artistic expression, right? You have to have that flexibility to truly court some of these great resources. Um, you know, the people who are good at sales, the people who are good at account management, they're not your typical nine to five. They can't show up and, and, and those roles, they're, they they're don't, gonna, they don't succeed they, in that environment. They, but they're also the people that at nine o'clock at night, they're on the phone, right? Yeah. Holy shit, something went sideways on Sunday. I'm figuring it out. Right? What in and Christmas? I'm going to work on it. During Christmas. You know? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I just want to piggyback a bit on one statement you made with respect to cultivating or nurturing a relationship and that client opening up to an extent that will be suffice for you to find the uh, common ground, ground over there or the common reasoning to actually develop that relationship. The same goes with the relationship of the account manager with the delivery team. Of course, in the absence of the account manager, as we see this on Vogue, um, we have the sales individual that needs to cultivate that kind of relationship with John Doe also and, you know, be able to joke with him or her that, you know, uh, what happened at the last WBR or, um, well, you, you went in your honeymoon and things were better. Like, you know, like I have a, a bit of a joke yeah. showing that, you know, y you know what's happening in their personal life a bit. And, you know, you're, you're here and you're invested also in the problems that they're facing because, you know, most of the times um, I've seen this, it, it's, it, it's, it's marked by extreme fatigue and frustration. There's a huge battle between sales and delivery. Mm -hmm. And everybody listens, but no one actually listens. So it's like one vents, the others then vents. And at the end of the day, you know, it's focused on commission and focused on lower costs. But, you know, that that's that's not the way. And often it is very easy for us to judge and say, you know, if that sales guy would have been different or if that delivery guy would have been different. But I, th I think, or what I started looking at, and I saw that this culture is not only cascaded, but nurtured, is from the XCOM. Mm. The executive committee itself, by shaping and following specific KPIs, was creating the environment where this mentality, if I don't care what's happening in the background as long as KPIs are touched and bonuses are get are, are, are received, we need to move forward. I mean, I'll 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 let you take it from the ops perspective, but from a sales perspective, you see that all the time, right? You've got sales guys that are out there and you know they're writing dirty, dirty deals, right? And the executive team just says, Hey, they're they're hitting their quota. In fact, they're they're double what you're doing, you know. But then you look at the default rate, right? And you look at the satisfaction rate. Well, let's look at churn. Like, well, let's mean, look at churn. You want to grow your company? By all means, go for it. You know, I'm. You know, I think about it in terms of baseball. I'm a singles and doubles hitter, man. I hit for average. I go out there, and every year I have sales. Every year I'm I'm moving the ball forward. Every year I'm generating revenue. I very rarely hit home runs unless it's again, you know, that long sales cycle sort of referral type program where you've got an opportunity to grow much more likely than I'm to grow organically. And I think that large in part, and we all have gotten lucky in sales before too, mm -hmm. you know, the people who are hitting for average are the ones who are going to make your company much more money over the long term. And yep. the guys who are out there mashing home runs, over promising and under delivering it's, it's going to, to your point, it's going to create a culture of distrust between the ops team and the sales team. And, you know, that, that person, that, that prospect is only going to live out their contract. You're going to see huge churn. And I'll tell you what, if you're, you know, on average in enterprise where our contracts are what, three years, right? Two, three years. Um, yeah. That salesperson ain't going to be at the end of that contract to, to negotiate the, the renewal anyway, because whether or not, <laughs> You know, those guys are going to go and seek new opportunities. They're never going to stay with you. They're always going to get rid of them. Paul, 
let me tell you something from my experience. They're always going to find a new ear that will be willing to listen to incredible results being promised. Yep. With minimum effort. Absolutely. But you know what? This goes back to the phenomena of winning the lottery. So you can't blame those guys, you know, because they, they're hearing some stories which are much more realistic in chance than winning the lottery. So of course you would be more tempted to give that guy or gal uh, a chance. And, um, you know, I, 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 was, I was actually thinking of the churn rate and of project help and of client sentiment. So if these three tend to have colors like, you know, so polarized that it would be easier for you to watch the entire episodes of Young and Restless, then I think, <laughs> I think you got a red flag there, buddy. Uh, and I think you, so whenever I, I would sit in XCOM uh, uh, conversations and I would hear someone taking a commitment like a, a building a huge tower it, with half of the money that the former guy uh, did when had the chance, in one fourth of the time, and with one fifth of personnel, and the others start applauding, I'm like, okay. It's time for me to drop the bomb. That's not going to happen. <laughs> so I, I did this once and I went and I pulled the guy over and I said, do, do you know that you've committed suicide, professional suicide as we speak? He said, yeah, but I really think I can make it. I said, mate, no, you're, listen, I don't want to discourage you. I don't want to kill your dream, but you have two, two quarters. And this is something that unless, I don't know, it's going to be driven by pandemic or a higher force or the end of the world or something, you're not going to touch those KPI." Yeah, but I did got applaud for a second. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's sad, but you know what? Uh, there's there's always going to be a new year willing to listen, to take risks. Why? Because very rarely people challenge something that sounds too good to be true. Yeah. That's number one. And number two is ask others. If you would tell them the recipe for the success within a specific project, and that would take time, money, nerves, effort, sweat, and blood, it doesn't sound appealing. It doesn't sound sexy. It doesn't sound like something you want to get into, right? And, but if you promise like high rewards with you know, less efforts and resources, that's what anybody, everybody starts to listen. And when it's judgment day, everybody starts pointing fingers. So listen, I thought this might happen in startups. I thought this might happen in scale-ups. I thought this would happen in multinationals with 100,000 employees. But it also happens in multinationals with 500,000 employees. Listen to all the stock market. Why? Because we have executives that enjoy hearing this and are willing to take the risk because they want to be famous in their mandate as they disrupted something. So it's not going to end, Paul. We're going to continue with these stories. We just have to park them aside for now so we can move to the next topic. But... Thanks for the deep dive into it. And yeah, to come back a bit to the question you had for me, I think we underestimate severely the importance of account managers. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I guess circling back to my original, I, I, I think I answered pandemic. I did not answer recession. Um, and I think mm -hmm. the two sort of co-assign, uh, coexist with one another. Mm -hmm. Um you know, the biggest thing, at least in the BPO industry that we saw during the pandemic was this skyrocketing in rates, right? We had a bunch of people that, you know, were underemployed or unemployed, but that weren't trying to be employed because of the scenario of the pandemic itself, right? So we had huge attrition. Mm -hmm. You know, the rates went from, hey, we were reliably able to hire in the United States for 12, 13 bucks an hour. And now yep. all of a sudden, 19. we didn't have a I mean, if you weren't 15 bucks that was like the absolute bottom. And even that was, you're going to have huge attrition problems. So you're typically at 17, 18, 19 yeah, bucks 19. an hour, right? And so um, going through to the recession now, I think the biggest struggle point for clients is I think they thought, well, aren't the rates like going down? Aren't they going to go back? And it's like, no, this is the new normal, right? Like, you know, we talk about, you know, the secret sauce at Healthware. We have a very flat yeah. organization, and that flat organization cool. is supported by the frontline agents. 
And the secret sauce for us is that we just have a little bit lower margins. And instead of returning that back to our, you know, we have lower, you know, fixed costs that we need to return to our executive team. We pay the agents more. Yeah. We just pay them a little bit more. I was just more. about to say that, that this is something that everybody can start doing as of tomorrow. And you know yeah. what? You know what? They would be willing to invest $3 million in their premises just to change the furniture, but they would not be willing to put a 5% in addition to someone's salary. And I mean, listen, when I have conversations with prospects, if they're gonna, if I'm gonna just be an order taker, right, and they tell me what I need to do to win the deal, and I just fill it out and I, I submit it and, and earn the commission, you know, we'll we'll write that deal, right? If, if that's ultimately what you want to do, but we're gonna have a conversation before that point because I'm gonna describe to you what your your realities are going to be, right? Yeah, you are gonna have attrition that's through the roof. It's gonna be churning and burning. The, what you thought was going to be a fantastic productive hour is not going to be productive hour because these agents are going to be the type of agents that are constantly clocking out on unscheduled breaks, that are constantly bending the rules. They're going to be the ones that are the SLA shavers, right? They're they're trying to find any angle that they can hit their SLAs without actually doing what the SLA is intended to drive there, right? Um, you know, whereas again, even a quarter, fifty cents, a buck higher. All of a sudden, now you're getting a much higher quality agent, and that's going to go all the way up the chain. You know, we talk all the time, oh, we're going to improve attrition through gamification, or we're going to improve attrition because we're going to provide career pathing to the agents. When at the end of the day, is there really that much career pathing? A lot of that is just us shuffling the deck in terms of, you know, SME roles, QAs, and those types of things within the organization. Whereas if we start off with a living wage and yep. we start off giving that employee a equity and, you know, it's not an equity share, but I know, I know. equity in how we're building out FAQs, yep. managing the knowledge base, helping build processes, all of a sudden you're going to find that your attrition problems have vanished, right? And now you're the BPO or the project that everybody at the BPO wants to get assigned to when you're doing your ramps. You would see talent migrating towards you, not from you. That would yep. be, and it uh, has nothing to do. You know, you don't have to be a cool. You know, it doesn't have to be Netflix. It doesn't have to be. I mean, you can be yeah. like in automotive. We we struggle sometimes, right? Because it's not the sexy brand. It's not a tech startup, or it's not Facebook, or it's not Apple. You know what I mean? But man, there's dynamic roles within that. You know. For automotive, we've got people who do complex case management. We've got paralegals that are in there helping to negotiate. We've got big budgets for givebacks and, and helping to navigate that process. And, you know, there's cool stuff in there. And it's just sort of how you manage it. And when you're trying to constantly manage to a salary target, um, again, you can win deals like that, but you don't usually keep clients. Yeah, and you know what? To my surprise... Most of the clients, and when I say most, I'm referring to over 65% of them, uh, are also willing to pay the higher buck if they know that this is heading towards the employees. The agent, right. Yes, that yeah. is a great point. Uh, and just by not discussing it also shows again that uh, you're doing something faulty over there. With respect to what you mentioned uh, about educating the client over there, I got to be honest, Paul, my favorite clients are the ones that actually still have blisters from their past experience when they went with the lower buck or the incredible mm -hmm. results. Or, and I, and I was sitting in an auction and I actually lost it because someone came in and said that in Europe they would be able to hire 80 folks in less than two months with a language I know that it's pretty hard to, to hire. And I lost that deal. And eventually that... That that client, I, I remember the look on his face when you know I, I looked and I said, okay, I lost it. And I just looked and I said, Jesus, is, this is like the lamb going to the slaughterhouse. This guy has <laughs> no idea what he has signed for. And eventually, you know, we started conversations a bit later and I just had to treat them. And, and, and you know, I just asked, I said, how was the burn? I said, yeah, you know what? We want to bring you in because that guy can only deliver like a third. And I said, that, that's what I promised you. So... But will you extend the timeline or do we need to bring a third one so that we can go in parallel? And get this, we're cannibalizing each other because we're on the same market. Yeah. 
<laughs> so the client oh, said, absolutely. "Oh, uh, the client said, oh, I didn't think of this." And I said, "Okay, it's it's okay for you to throw a bone within three vendors, but if we're on the same market for the same rare talent, you're cannibalizing between us. You're you're ruining the business itself. It's you know, it's 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 a destructive process." And, Sales uh, tip and tactic too in in that little nugget is making sure that you're following up with your lost deals. By the way, I mean that's where a lot of deals exist is mm -hmm. going back and following up and asking how the burn feel. <laughs> um, you know, uh, making sure that when you say that you're going to follow up in a year, you're going to actually follow up in a year. I mean, I can't tell you how many times that people were absolutely blown away by the fact that I had just scheduled a calendar invite to respond back to them when I said I would. Yeah. Um, it's a very easy way to gain credibility. Absolutely. And it just shows you're committed regardless of where you're working. You still want to keep in touch and, you know, you're open to explore over there and, and see how you can help them. You're invested to help them navigate through the challenges that they are uh, facing. And one last thing with respect to uh, the, the, the remark I had that clients would be actually willing to pay the higher buck if it knew that, you know, it's going directly to the agents over there or improve the quality of their lives in a different way. I don't know if it's team buildings or whatever. I mean, from an EBITDA point of view, we shouldn't stress about it. There's so many ways to, you know, to bring efficiency in that buck, additional buck that you're getting in order to make the agents of uh, life better. So you don't have to worry about paying taxes over there if you're trying to, to use this as an excuse that you're not doing it because of taxes. I, I, I can give you four or five tips if you want. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But in a separate conversation. But hey, that's that accounting that we learn, you know. Yeah. No. Being a small no. Oh, owner. okay. <laughs> We're gonna pay you this. Oh, you're gonna lose sixty percent, fifty percent. Let's not lose anything of it. Let's find ways to use it at max. I mean, I love these challenges. But I saw, and this is really sad, that whenever times are very hard and things are struggling, then the executives say we are a family. We need to stick together. We're like a family. And then when they dictate the market and they dictate the game, then it's like, I'm your boss. This is what you're getting. You don't like it. Get another job. This is sad what I'm telling you, but I've seen it, you know, with ups and downs and cold shower, hot shower, like the Scottish shower, right? I've seen it so many times in the past years, combining between pandemic and recession that it's, you know, it's, it's still hitting me like a very, very um, strange alien thing that is actually happening. So it, when it's really, it's really tough because what you're trying to do, and again, as a sales professional, you are your own business, right? Um, you're constantly trying to interview your executive team to make sure that that's a, a that you have a shared ideals, right? Yeah. Um, and in the BPO industry, it can be challenged, right? Like I ended up at Concentrix, but I ended up at Concentrix. The company that I was at previously was bought and sold six times. I had six different CEOs and management teams in that time, wow. right? So where, you know, when you're dealing with smaller or medium sized BPOs, that leadership team can change constantly. Yeah. Um, it's really difficult to maintain that sort of brand loyalty of 30 years and you get a gold pocket watch at retirement, right? It doesn't really exist anymore. Um, I would challenge that, you know, again, a pearl of wisdom for prospective sales or enterprise salespeople is that you need to constantly be mindful of that leadership team and make sure that they align with your goals. I mean, we came from an organization where we had a really good one and then we had a really bad one. Um, so it, it changes and it's a dynamic situation. And so if you're not listening to those cues, you're doing yourself a disservice yeah. Um, and I would say that, you know, to that extent, you also need to be listening to what the market is telling you. And maybe that's sort of your signal for it's time to make a change. Oh, absolutely. I think this is quite the signal, <laughs> if you ask me, <laughs> quite the signal. Um, so thanks. Thanks for this tip. Um, Paul, do you think, um, how do you see European talent? Do you think it's getting too expensive for the entire global equation? that clients have? Um, so I think ultimately, you know, AI is trying to solve for language, right? And in yeah. a perfect utopia, AI would take what I'm speaking to you and in real time, in perfect dialect, 
give an auditory rendering of it in any language ever. And maybe one day we'll get there, but I'm guessing we'll probably never get there because translation, frankly, colloquialisms, you know, the little sayings, the little things that personify When us we say it's raining, raining, yeah. When we say it's raining with cats and dogs, it doesn't mean that cats and dogs are pouring from the sky. That's what Paul Precisely. is trying to say here with respect to AI translating, right? So, I, I, you know, I really think that there's never going to be a perfect solution in that. And so I think that gray area is where European talent in particular, because there's that diversity in language, can thrive. Um, mm -hmm. I also think that from a cost perspective, you know, and we're making big investments in Africa, right? And through the colonial history, Africa has a lot of European languages as well. Um, so there's absolutely low cost options, but there's always been low cost options, right? I yep. mean, India, Philippines, there's always been those options out there. And I think Europe in particular has still has greenfield markets to explore, still has a ton of talent that's you know, just absolutely fantastic. And I think, you know, I'll take one specific example where I think it's, a, it's an absolute game changer in winter. Please. So I've done quite a bit of sales into um, annotation data labeling. Um, so it's these huge back office tasks for autonomous driving companies where basically they've got an image and it's, okay, here's a street view. Here's what our car sees. Uh -huh. We don't want it to run over a, a woman and child. We don't want yep. it to crash into a tree. We got to make sure that all these objects it can recognize and understand it. And so on the back end of that algorithm is people just looking at images all day and correcting what the, the algorithm sees. What the program, yeah. Straight up just labeling everything themselves, right? And so for many years, and I've sold in all locations, you know, India has been a great place for this from a cost perspective because it really is sort of rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. But I maintain and have still gone in and sold that European market because the conditions are unique is a fantastic option for this, right? Yes, it might be one or two bucks higher, right, than the, the absolute lowest cost data labeling that you can find out there. But the understanding of what a roundabout is, the signage, you know, where a cafe is, how to understand a board that pops out of the fucking ground and then, you know, goes yep. back down to route traffic. That doesn't exist anywhere else in the That's world. That's a cultural difference. That's a cultural difference. And what you're saying over here is not ignore the cultural factor when doing global business. Absolutely. And and I think that's where Europe continues to win. I think, you know, certainly the dialects and the language continues to be a, a, a good situation. And I think still, you know, let's face it. I, I don't know. I, mm -hmm. I always have the low cost option in every single one of my proposals. But I'll be honest, it doesn't get selected with nearly as much frequency as people I think think they do. Right. You know, Customers aren't necessarily willing to gamble on cheap, 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 even if cheap literally is better, right? I mean, in many cases, yeah, the labor rate is lower, but the quality of person is fantastic, right? Yeah. Um, and so you're still going to have, you know, Romania, Poland, Albania, Georgia. I mean, Ukraine is still fantastic. We have great operations out of there with no service interruptions. I understand from a, a, a... You guys are really on the eastern side of it, just giving folks a, kind of a geo details, which is on the border with uh, Romania and Poland and Hungary. So they're very fine over there. Even the ski set, it's really nice at Bukovel, so you can go and ski. It's absolutely fine. Just giving yes. a bit of insights to our listeners. Yeah. No, I, I, it's a great point. And, and it's tough because I know organizations are like, well, isn't it just a, a, a horrible war zone over there? And it's like, no, not really. I mean, yes, and it's a tragedy, and I don't want to downplay anything mm -hmm. that's going on over there for sure. But in terms of service delivery, I mean, these are fantastic resources that work their ass off. Yeah. Um, you know, our teams in Ukraine are some of the very best that we have within the entire organization and yeah. continue to be. Um, so, no, I, I see Europe as, as something that is never going to go away. I think that specialization is paramount for every region, including low cost. And the more that you can bring that culture into your proposals and into your practice, um, the way that that's the way to, to demonstrate and ultimately sell that through.
And Paul, I think this is the fifth episode in which I'm tar- talking about, you know, how vital the understanding the culture, cultural aspect uh, in this mix to do a global business is. And uh, I used to have a political philosophy teacher. Um, he, he always, he wouldn't say United States. He would say the, the cultural daughter of Europe. <laughs> And, and it, you know, it, it, it stick with me because it, it it's also part of the reason why the business flows differently between these two regions. And you can't, you know, just ignore history or forget about it. And I do believe that the European component in terms of talent is pivotal for the global success of any major player that has made serious waves on the domestic market and now is looking to flex muscles globally. Uh, there have been others that tried different substitutions. Uh, we're going to touch, you know, uh, some of them when we talk about nearshore, depending on location. But at some point, you will hit a, a, a certain market, like Nordics or the Dock region, where you're going to have to make an investment to actually be successful over there. Or otherwise, such a tiny piece in your puzzle is going to break your entire board. So um, talking about you know, staff augmentation about nearshore, offshore uh, solutions. Um, I think we have to go beyond the solution and actually talk about partnership. If we're just going to sell a solution, uh, you know, as we mentioned, it's going to be that distance. You're going to be easy uh, to uh, replicate and replace uh, eventually. But so let, let's talk about where's the future of uh, staff augmentation heading and uh, what about nearshore offshoring? Do you see a future over here? Do you see an expansion? Do you still see a hunger over here in terms of what clients are thinking? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think staff augmentation continues to be a fantastic um, option, right? Mm -hmm. I think the challenge is is that most companies are looking at how do we manage that bottom line, particularly labor, in the best way possible. So they're looking for, hey, we want a dedicated model, but we want to outsource all of it. You know, yeah. um, I think staff augmentation is is uniquely successful when we're talking about um, digital development. I think IT support in particular is something mm-hmm. where you have to have boots on the ground within your own organization, not just leadership, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but when we start getting into sort of that L1 customer service sort of frontline agent type thing, you know, significantly less. Um, in fact, you know, Candidly, most customers are, are coming to us and saying, hey, listen, we're, we've had suffered from horrible attrition since the pandemic. We're willing to outsource to you and you'll just pick up, you know, your ramp classes will be our attrition, right? And on our march to basically not having any of these sort of operations. But then in tandem with that, to your second question, yeah. that means that, you know, we're not necessarily looking to put all of this in a super low cost region. Yeah. We want to have near shore or onshore, depending. And we want a higher quality of agent because, you know, you're taking that sort of internal prospect out term or, you know, external. Yeah, yeah external. Um, and so, you know, we absolutely need to have this near shore and we need to have the languages that we need to have. And, you know, I would say that for any, you know, business or sales executive that says that that's primarily sold in a particular place like the United States and is looking to move abroad. Mm-hmm. I think your case study is absolutely Canada if you're looking for something nearby because mm. it is truly a multilingual nation that takes that very seriously. You know, it's not just everything in English and everybody else can pound sand. Like, yeah, <laughs> they cater to it, right? And and I think that's how you need to think about your business interactions as well. Um, you know, I, I, I say this, but I am not um, bilingual myself, but I think that when you look at how you interact with prospects and clients, you need to make sure that to your point, you make an investment and that you're bringing somebody, you know, when I went to Berlin, I had somebody that was on site that worked there that could give that sort of local flavor. And even though that client was also in Berlin and understood many of these factors, you know, if it was just me sitting there yapping the whole time, I have zero credibility in that. And I have to bring those resources and my company needs to and has made investment in those resources to be able to talk intelligently about how we would, you know, 
basically take a proof of concept and build it out and start to go near shore and cost optimize and that side of thing. Yeah, and I think you, you've mentioned something really gold over there uh, with respect to attacking the U.S. market or serving uh, a, a client that originally comes from the U.S. market. Because, um, you know, there are a lot of companies from Asia trying to tap into this market, right? Sure. And you just, you just said right now that the paradigm is changing towards nearshore. And I think, you know, uh, besides the cultural component over there, there's also the time zone component, which is uh, important. And, and this has been my experience also. I see more and more uh, U.S. companies investing in LATAM and, and uh, you know, the northern side, Canada over there, before making a jump towards Europe or towards Asia. Yeah, I mean, certainly from a U.S. perspective, Latin America is a fantastic market. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I say this all the time, and I've already said it once in this conversation, you know, yeah. we are the fifth largest Spanish speaking nation in the world. So and, and it's the perfect dialect of Spanish, too. I mean, there's there's case studies that show, you know, uh, Latin American countries, that sort of language or that accent neutralization doesn't need to exist. In the United States, we're already comfortable. That isn't an accent to us. That's fairly reasonable, regardless of whether you're a border state with yeah. Mexico. Or, you know, we've, we've got tons of seasonal labor that comes up here in Detroit and Michigan. I mean, 100%. So it, it is a fantastic option. And to your point, the time zone is so, is, is nice, right? Because that's one of those things where a client kind of feels a bit out of control if yeah. they can't reach an operations team on the right time zone. Um, it's, it, you know, your, your team leads and everything can be available on, on time, but if the, the site leader or the, you know, the, the, the actual operations site chief isn't there, if your QA isn't working on hours and those types of things, it can be really challenging for them to get data that they need and those types of things. So I think that, that is definitely one hindrance, particularly in operations from the United States outsourcing to Europe. But again, you know, you've still got a lot of languages that need to be serviced that yeah. aren't necessarily being serviced. Yeah, uh, and, and not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, nearshore solutions being the actual solution that will be the fit for solving this problem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and um, I was, you know, I was thinking of the, the current company you are working with, and... Um, I, it came back to me that you said that you're trying to put some of the budget that was referring to, uh, you know, overheads and, 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 and costs that you would have, let's say, over there with the premise or with the office and actually redirect that towards the quality of the uh, agent and the uh, remuneration package and the, the benefits. So how many uh, locations does uh, Helpware have at this moment open worldwide? We have 17. Um, we're way punching above our weight in terms of size STE we are as an organization and sites that we maintain. Um, one of the things that I think, I, I don't know, necessarily unique, it's certainly a trend in the industry. Yep. But when we think about remote, we always maintain an office at every location, even where we're remote, right? Okay. Because that type of redundancy, we, we call it a hub and spoke model, right? If you think about an old wagon wheel, right? Um, you know, agents working from home, the, the biggest challenge they have is redundancy, right? What if power goes off? What if their internet bill mm -hmm. maybe wasn't paid on time? What happens if their computer breaks? What happens if, you know, they're having just generic technical problems? And so, so having sleep an better. office that they can mm -hmm. come into and hotel there, and also in almost every single deal that I write, yes, the agents are going to be remote, but training is going to be on site. Right. Yeah. They need that enculturation training too. Right. It, there's there's usually one or two days where it's just helpware training. Right. These are your leadership team. This is who you're working for in addition to working for, you know, whatever brand our end client is. Right. This is how we do things. We provide mental health services to our agents. We have a personal trainer Slack channel where we're giving workout, and, you know, nutrition tips and tricks to help keep our agents healthy. Um, and that type of culture is part of the deal even 
above and beyond just paying them extra. And so having an agent feel supported, particularly in a remote environment, I think, and studies show, that it leads to a significantly lower attrition rate. Um, now, is that office, you know, a uh, 16,000 seat center? Absolutely not, right? We are remote. We don't have that overhead. We return that value back to both the agent and the client. Um, yeah, better price and, and better salaries. Uh, that's a pretty exactly. good deal. Um, I yep. just, before you move forward, I just want to uh, pause a bit and, and come back to what you said about um, an, having an in house training. I think. You know, as much as we would like to say that as a result of the pandemics, the world has changed and we're having a different approach to how we implement projects, I think this process of at least the training to be done under the same roof, creating team chemistry for new projects, new deals, new new clients, especially new LOBs, right? Because Maybe it's not, it's enterprise support, it's not customer support, right? Uh, and I think this is an exercise that should not in any way make any uh, economy at or, or, or try to pause it or, or take a shortcut or try to cut it uh, within the process and make sure you stick with it because that will be the core team on which you will actually build that relationship with a client. Absolutely. I mean, we had we had a client, just as an example, they wanted us to open a greenfield site. They had a particular geography that they wanted to do business in. They yeah. laid out all the points of why, and they said, hey, would you be willing to open up a center? And we said, hey, no problem, right? Yeah. That training, we didn't have a building yet. Yeah. We got a hotel. We rented a ballroom. We had them bring in telco and you know, internet connectivity via Wi-Fi and tables for everybody. And we still did the training on site because, you know, listen, we've got great tools now. I think Slack is wonderful. I think, you yeah. know, being able to build out Teams environments and those things are an incredible leap forward. But at the end of the day, where your agents are going to build relationships in terms of the team members that they turn to with questions or how they solve problems within the structure of, of the team, you know, having that at least initial sort of face-to-face -face is so important. And, you know, listen, there are trainings that we push remotely. Um, you know, if there's generic sort of HR. Exactly. You know, but when it's yeah, product exactly. training, you know, like in automotive, we do this all the time. And I, I encourage it. I, I had a client many years ago who did this, and I've taken it with me to every other subsequent client. You know, I know you're the manufacturer, but... We are, if, if we're putting a center in Utah or Detroit or wherever we're, I guarantee you there's a dealership nearby. Yeah. Every single one of those agents is going to go to the dealership and get the dealership tour. We want them to sit in a car. Yeah. We want them to understand how the service lane works. We want to understand how the sales floor is. We want them to walk around the dealer. I mean, they have to give sort of these tips and tricks and walk the customer, the client, the owner, the driver through these things. They need to have experienced it for themselves. And even when we talk about nearshoring, I had a client, they were like, well, you know, if we go to Costa Rica, what, you know, do they even have, I'm like, do they even have cars? What are you talking about? They have three dealerships around the center. We're going to take them to one of your dealerships <laughs> and they're going to learn your cars. You know, yes, the cars might be a little bit different, right? Like, you know, correct, the, the correct, product correct. sets could differ from country it's to country. It's tailored, yeah. Again, the, the overarching culture, if you're doing a good job, it should be pretty you know similar throughout that. And regardless of if you're in the auto industry or anywhere else, again, some of those first indoctrination trainings are so important. Yeah. Having them in a live environment, I think, is just, you know, it, it breeds that confidence that, particularly for BPO, I mean, it, we've all seen or heard about the BPOs that only exist sort of on paper, right? And it's like there is no office and there's no management or maybe it's one guy who's hiring a bunch of people because he's got an onshore connect that can kind of Correct. make it seem like they're an organization, right? And so these people are many times, you know, if they're an agent, they've been an agent for years and they've never really moved past L1 in their career or maybe they've moved to L2, they've probably been burned by one of those a time or two, right? They go, they take, they quit their existing job, they go take an offer, oh, 
well, we didn't, we, contracting fell through. Sorry, too bad, so sad. We don't need you anymore. Hit the deck. And so as a BPO, that's a fantastic way to be able to make sure that your employees feel valued and that they feel like they're a part of something greater and gives them the confidence that there is a career path with you and that they should stay the long haul. Yeah, I, you know what? Sometimes I also um, I also discovered that uh, people put you know bumps uh, for themselves or borders for themselves. Uh, they have this misjudgment or certain ideas that if you were to do some things in a different location, although you, as you mentioned, that client already existed over there and it was already selling. But coming back to what you said about this, uh, in, I, I call it induction training because it's a new project. I also, depending, well, when I had projects on cybersecurity or, or more sensitive matters, or, you know, I would call them heavy product because they're heavy to navigate and uh, they're, they're quite critical in terms of actions or reactions. I would always ask the client, would you like someone from your team to be on site during this phase? And, I would usually invite the person that would be above the team lead or the program manager because they would work in direct contact. And I, I, I always laugh when I think back at the pizza parties and, and, and the beer parties at the end of the induction training and, and how they remember and they joke on the Slack channel afterwards about, you know, who got drunk and the relationship that was built over there, the, the social side of things, right? And you would see that also that guy that is your team lead, your, you know, your mentor or your boss is a human being and, and is approachable and can hear out your mistake and is here to help you correct it. So, yeah. It, it flows both ways, right? When I said earlier that sales, you're not too good to, to be part of an everyday, you know, client meeting or a yeah. calibration session, you know, client prospect, you're not too above your customer service operation Absolutely. to not sit with those folks. I mean, your best clients and, you know, we can't all pick our clients perfectly, right? But your best clients are the ones who want to have a vested interest in their operations. They're the ones who know their team leads names and who get to know the people that are on the front lines of their business and who care about it. I mean, I've staffed, you know, smaller deals throughout my career and, mm -hmm. and even continue today because of relationships that I've had that they start startups and they need like one or two. Right. But I mean, they do such a good job and they're like, wow, you know, X, Y, Z person has become an extension of our brand. We love that person. I mean, we've even seen where all of a sudden co-employment starts becoming an issue and they get hired away from us or they get poached from us. But, you know, in some cases, those are success stories, right? Yeah. Because those are your proof cases that, we did such a good job that this person became a pillar of your organization, so much so that their knowledge could not be separated from the organization. And so you ended up paying them even more than we were paying them to bring them in-house. And so sometimes short term, that can feel like a big loss. But, you know, from a relationship perspective, take heart. You're doing a good job there. You're staffing such a good close fit that they see those resources as, as you know, super important. So basically, on what you told me so far, if I were to take all these lessons and uh, extrapolate them towards how to treat employees and maybe fight attrition, definitely it would be the allowing the remote component once the induction training has been succeeded and the client trust has been established. Find ways to lower cost, but don't consider salaries in that category. In fact, the what you're taking as headroom from where you're saving should be reinvested in the uh, human component. And would it be something else over here to pass on, Paul, on the attrition side of things and human investment? Um, it, it's, it's more of a personal bias. But you know, I've seen a lot. I, I've seen a lot of investment in L zero. We talked a little bit about it earlier. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, that's another one of those cost optimizations that ends up impacting your your agent yeah. costs, right? Except in this case, it's just eliminating jobs. I would maintain that in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, if that L zero, that technology, that budget was removed and returned back to your agents, the same type of productivity would be created without having to necessarily always increase headcount, right? Um, 
invest in your employees, even mm-hmm. your outsourced employees. They're an extension of your brand. They're an extension of your your culture. And if you're constantly one that's trying to churn and burn, you're going to find that your results are churning and burning. And you're going to have way more of your gratuity spend being spent. You're going to have way more of your customers being pissed off. And, you know, I, I think we've gotten addicted to this by modeling our companies after big tech, right? We want to all have a share price of Apple. We all want to have a share price of Meta, of Amazon, of those types of things. But I mean, this idea that in perpetuity, we're going to just push people to a ticketing system, particularly for B2B or complex problems and questions. It's just, it's not the way to go. When you have a monopoly like Apple does or like Amazon does, yeah, they can get away with it. But, you know, if you're starting to build a multinational hundred million, one billion dollar business, you can't always, you know, you got to think about your differentiator as well. And I think the human element, the human component will continue to play a huge part in that. I feel the same way. And I think, you know, with some of the horror movies that we've seen with machines are, we just have to learn to work with them, guys. Uh, they're here to make our lives easy. So no one's going to lose their job if they know how to work with those tools. Of course, if you don't learn anything new, you become obsolete yourself. Our, yeah, I, I, that would put a modifier on that for sure. I mean, I am not encouraging like, hey, as a BPO, don't invest in technology correct, solutions. Correct, correct, correct. Or as a client, same thing. I mean, you have to stay on the bleeding edge. But if you think that there's going to be this 100% optimization through technology, I think you're, you're selling yourself and you're selling your overall experience very short. Well, I, I'm going to sleep better tonight because I know that as long as I leave, at least people will do business with people. Uh, which was the core essence of our conversation today. Your last message for executives, boards, VCs in this BPO industry trying to, you know, grow aggressively and uh, have exposure in multiple geography, what would be your, let's say, doctor's advice over here? Um, I would say grow smartly. Right. We talked a lot about home run hitters when we were zeroing in on bad sales practices versus good sales practices. But from a leadership team perspective, you have to understand what your niche is and you have to expand on that. That's not to say that you always, you know, if you're a healthcare specific company, you only play in the healthcare space. Mm-hmm. But you need to figure out how to branch out. And I think a lot of times folks are trying to boil the ocean and, and just, hey, we can do business with anybody. And it's like, can you? Yes. Is that going to be a sustainable sales strategy that's truly going to grow? That would be my first red flag. To hit those, those, those markets and those margins? No, absolutely not. Really focus on where you can win, what size deals, and it goes in both directions, right? Maybe you're not a great fit for a huge 500 FTE deal that pays on net 60 payment terms and needs to carry $25 million limited liability insurance. But at the same time, don't drive your middle management below or people crazy sign in two, three FTE deals where now all of a sudden you're so stretched over 1,600 clients that are too small and shitty. And it's like, there's no growth. They're basically lottery tickets because it's sort of these startups that you're working with <laughs> and you just don't have, you'll never achieve the ratios that you need to manage those businesses effectively. So it's really finding that middle ground of where you can be successful and then, you know, building that process, building that out and, you know, ramping effectively, not always, you know, going after those home runs. So if I were to replace the word work with grow, it would be work, grow smart, not hard. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much for the insights shared today, Paul. And it was a pleasure sparring with you on this topic and appreciate cascading from your knowledge. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.